Want to turn the fattest possible profit? Hike those prices and cut that worker pay. Want to support the growth of private firms? Slash taxes for billionaires. Want to boost potential GDP? Up those working hours. Want to be the biggest, baddest economy in the land? Don't worry about inequality, wealth distribution, or quality of life. It's all about that production, baby. So, we often think of economic growth and success as being at odds with human happiness. But it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, a lot of the time, policies that make life better for human beings are the same things that grow GDP in both the short run and the long run. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall, Macroeconomics. We already know that the government can jump in when things aren't going exactly swimmingly, economy-wise. In our episode on fiscal policy, we talked about how Congress uses taxation and spending to influence the national economy. They can roll out expansionary fiscal policy to boost GDP by doing things like funding government projects, like the Hoover Dam during the Great Depression. This bumped up both employment and GDP, providing some relief for the economy and the people. It got workers back into jobs, paychecks back into pockets, and food back onto tables. Plus, we all get to benefit from infrastructure improvements like dams or bridges. And sometimes, like good cheese, the benefits of fiscal policy get even better with age. In macroeconomics, the long run isn't about how long it takes a wheel of Gruyere to reach perfection, but the period of time it takes for price levels, wages, and other variables to have a chance to adjust to shifts in the market. And in long-run fiscal policy, the intention is not to affect short-term aggregate demand, but the whole enchilada, potential GDP. Do you want that with red sauce, green sauce, or mole? Potential GDP, while somewhat less delicious than your favorite Mexican dish, is really important economically. It refers to all of the goods and services an economy could produce if labor and capital were utilized at their maximum sustainable rates. Definitely cheesy and, like finding good Mexican food in the US outside of the Southwest, so very theoretical. So the goal of long-run fiscal policy isn't to grow this year's GDP or the next year's GDP, but potential GDP by improving the economic potential of the country. And this means giving nationwide production a glow up. We give you higher national production. Certain kinds of fiscal policy can do a lot to increase an economy's capacity for production. Some spending bills, like the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, include programs to help businesses improve their infrastructure and training programs to help people get back to work in new industries. This not only ups spending and employment in the short run, but lays the groundwork for increased production down the line. There are even some examples of government spending specifically meant to boost our potential in ways we won't be able to see for decades, with some nice to have, but not really the point, short run benefits. A great example of this would be government investment in affordable higher education, which happens to be a top priority for us here at Study Hall too. Making college cheap or even free can have some nice economic effects in the short run. If someone can graduate from college sans debt or have their student loans forgiven by the government, then those graduates can spend their money on fun 20-something stuff like PBR, mozzarella sticks, and disco Shrek-themed raves instead of being buried under student loans and subsisting off of dollar ramen. This boosts short-run aggregate demand and therefore short-run GDP. But it also serves to increase that long-run potential GDP by investing in human capital the skills and abilities of the humans who make up the labor force. Making education accessible gives a country a more educated workforce, and the more educated the workforce is, the better they'll be at producing. In theory. I have a PhD and can tell you unequivocally that this isn't always the case. And these folks might go on to make advances in science and technology to further up production. Inventions like the computer have vastly increased worker productivity, and who knows what the next big technological thing could be. But we definitely can't get there without funding education. The government can further support advances in science and technology, and scientists themselves, by investing in good old R&D, 
research and development for those folks who spend their time among the living rather than locked in a basement lab pursuing the cure for cancer. By giving grants to labs and scientists, governments give them the means to purchase things like pocket protectors, fancy graphing calculators, uh, couture safety glasses, and nutritious meals for those lab rats, increasing short-run demand. And in the long run, like with education, government investment in research and development changes what we make and how we make it. This kind of spending helps us as a country find cures for diseases, solutions to climate change, and a recipe for vegan cheese that doesn't taste like cardboard. All of which impact our economic potential down the road. And, you know, our staying alive potential too. And when the government invests in infrastructure, like maintaining the US interstate highway system or the energy grid, we have the short run benefits of hiring more workers to get the job done, who then have the money to keep on spending. But we also get the long run benefit of products going from factory to shelf faster and cheaper and shoring up the infrastructure that keeps firms running in the first place. All of these policies invest in the economy directly by investing in people themselves. It's simple, straightforward, and like a grilled cheese with the perfect blend of cheddar and Velveeta, it just makes sense. There are even some policies whose whole point is to increase the well-being and standard of living for people in an economy. Following this guideline that happier, healthier residents lead directly to a stronger economy in the long run. For example, when governments in Europe made healthcare more affordable, it obviously boosted the quality of life for their labor force. But it also increased productivity, boosting long-run potential GDP as well. Subsidized childcare similarly benefits individual people and the economy as a whole because it increases the workforce. We also have government policies that are intended to reduce poverty and income inequality and boost spending. In the US, Social Security is a specialized directed payroll tax on workers, which is set aside and can be paid out to residents 62 or older. And the TANF program and SNAP, commonly known as food stamps, are direct transfers from the government to mitigate the effects of poverty for US residents. These programs mean, theoretically, all households can buy things like milk, bread, and yes, cheese feeding themselves and contributing to national GDP. Then there are other examples of government intervention that aren't precisely fiscal policy, but lead to positive economic results too. For instance, public goods like parks, libraries, and community centers boost mental health and decrease burnout and heart attacks and all the bad things that happen to a person when they don't play outside. And economically, most of the time, people who never leave the house aren't good workers or good spenders. But as it turns out, a little joie de vivre turns into a little more spending and even more economic success. I'm just gonna pretend it's fine that the government only cares about my mental health when it impacts how many pizza slices I buy at the pool snack shack. But the thing is, there's no competitive public pool market when admission is free. Government spending helps rec centers and libraries as well as your local public school system exist without the pressure to turn a profit. For institutions that aren't totally funded by the government in taxpayer dollars, like country clubs or private schools, the goal isn't simply to improve life for the people, but make money too, through admission fees and private donations. And if all our institutions operated like this, it would mean a sizable portion of the population simply couldn't participate because they couldn't afford $55,000 in private school tuition. These industries that don't quite work right in an entirely free market with no government interventions are examples of market failures. And without that government support for these institutions, both society and the economy would suffer. There would be other drawbacks to a completely free market sans government support too. Not only would we be stuck in a dystopian world void of free schools, libraries, or parks, but firms would have even more room to do all sorts of shady things to make a profit. That's because in addition to supporting society through spending, the government enforces important regulations to keep businesses at least mostly honest. And without government intervention and regulation, the only thing firms would have to answer to would be their own profit motive. In theory, the government actually works to encourage the competition of free market system requires, passing legislation against dangerous monopolies. If a single company or even a handful of companies totally dominate in a given industry, it suppresses competition. You know, that thing our whole economy is theoretically based around. 
and allows businesses themselves to set prices and wages rather than market forces. To that end, the government reviews mergers and acquisitions to determine if one firm is getting too big, cornering a market, and preventing competition. Recently, tech companies like Google, uh, the ticketing giant Live Nation Entertainment, and the grocery baron Kroger have all faced anti-monopoly scrutiny as they take over too big a slice of their respective industry, suppressing competition and fudging up our entire economic system, driving up those cheese prices in the dairy aisle. The court system, both civil and criminal, is another branch of government that serves to regulate business practices and improve life and the economy for everyone. They enforce private property rights and contracts, and in general try to decrease corruption and support ethical business practices. And since higher corruption is linked to lower GDP, this isn't only an ethical issue, but an economic one as well. So while we don't necessarily think of these things as fiscal policy, there's still really important ways the government keeps the economy running, people fed and happy, and everyone mostly honest. Like great cheese comes from happy cows, and happy cows come from California. Great productivity comes from happy workers, and happy workers come from economies with high levels of supportive government intervention. Not quite as catchy as the original, but it still works. In the US, policies like regulating firms to keep them honest, supporting public goods like parks, schools, and libraries, and investing in research and infrastructure projects are great for the people. And they're not only economically sustainable, but economically beneficial. Capitalism doesn't have to be at odds with happiness, either human or bovine. Of course, there's always more to be done. The government could cancel student debt, nationalize healthcare, boost funding for childcare, and improve support programs like SNAP. When it comes down to it, we could definitely be the, the happier. And our economy could be, too. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full Study Hall Macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out GoStudyHall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like comment your favorite Mexican dish, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.